Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a full life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, Lord, according to his glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son we love, who we need of redemption and forgiveness of sin. The vendor was selling bagels uh, for a dollar each on a street corner food stand. The jogger ran past and threw it in under the counter. But he didn't take a bagel, he just kept on going. So he did the same thing for months and months. And one day, as the driver was running past, the vendor stopped him. The driver said, You probably want to know why I always put money on the counter and never take a bagel. No, said the vendor, I just wanted to let you know that the bagel got up to $1.50. <laughs> I think that often I, and perhaps maybe you as well, treat God with the same kind of attitude as shown by that street vendor. Not only are we ungrateful for what he has given us, but we want more. Somehow we feel that God owes us things like good health, comfortable life, material blessings. God doesn't owe us anything, yet he gives us, he gives us everything. G.K. Chesterton wrote, Here dies another day during which I have had eyes, ears, hands, and the great world around me. And with more brings another, another day. So why am I allowed to? Today was so great. Psalm chapter 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So each day is one more gift from God. Our grateful response should be live to please Him. So as we participate in this communion, let's focus our thoughts on God and all the gifts. He has given us his love for us, his son, and we love be sacrificed on the cross for us. And I ask for Mark to say the blessing on you. Father, what a great morning for uh, this thought that Keith had this morning because it's a beautiful day and the sun is shining and it makes us feel so much better. Father, we realize that all that we have can, comes from you. And this, at this time, we want to remember that Jesus died on the cross for us, that he gave his life. And when we take this bread to remember the life that he gave, I pray your blessing upon this loaf as we partake of it together. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it's a beautiful day. And I am just so proud of you guys that you are here. <laughs> And not at the lake, uh, which I know as soon as you're done here, that's probably where you're headed. That's, that's okay. Um, just a quick update about Jared. Uh, he is on a different anti-nausea pill, which has actually been a lot more effective. Uh, he hasn't thrown up in like two days. And yesterday, for the first time in like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday he ate for the first time in like 10 days, and he kept it down, which is, which is a good step too. There was a bacteria in his system that was really messing with his stomach for a while, and uh, they think that that's kind of uh, going away. And so we're really optimistic that we might even be able to get him home for a few days this week. Uh, so please keep that in your prayer time as you pray, and I know you guys all are praying, and we... We feel that, we know that, and that, that's, we talked in our Sunday school class this morning how prayer provides peace for his people. And it's, uh, it's easy to say stuff like that uh, when you don't really have a clue what that really means, but I have a better idea of what it means to receive peace from prayer than I think I did even two months ago. Uh, so, and we're going to talk a little bit this morning about the power that's in suffering, and um, which is... 
Uh, again, I said this a few weeks ago, we're on a reading schedule, where I am, on the, through, the, through the Bible, and uh, it's a list that I put out with, for the leadership team when I first moved here, and I just said on every given Sunday, I'm just going to find something within these passages of scripture that week to preach on. You know what it is this week? The last two weeks? Job. So that's what we're talking about this morning, is Job. There's a lot of things to learn from uh, with Job. Um, Kyla had something special she wanted to, come on up here, honey. Um, the Relay for Life, I'm sorry, I told her, honey, I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> I'm not supposed to embarrass her. Um, she is the uh, the CEO, the chairman of the board, the president of the Relay for Life team. Uh, here, we're just going to share my mic, okay? How's that? So, uh, and she's got a couple things she wants to say um, about what it is they're doing. And uh, apparently, the, we had some teenagers that wanted to join the Relay for Life team that we already have, but you're only allowed a certain number of people. And so... They, that team was already too big, so they just decided, our, our kids just decided to make their own team. So I think that's pretty exciting. Uh, but they need a little support and a little help, and so Kyla's here to kind of um, to ask for that. What's the name of your team first? Jaywalkers. The Jaywalkers. Very nice. Okay, good. And uh, I know we, we scripted this out, so let me make sure I'm asking the right questions. <laughs> okay. Um, they need an adult sponsor. Christy and I would be more than happy to help them with it, but we don't know what our schedule, we can't plan, you know, a week out in advance. We just don't know where we're going to be on any given day. So they do need an adult sponsor. And so what does an adult sponsor do exactly? They just have to be at all the fundraisers, all the meetings, and the actual relay, and they just have to make sure that we're well behaved. Okay, which shouldn't be a problem. I mean, come on, girl. Not a challenge there. Um, how often do you have meetings? Uh, it kind of just depends on when we have the fundraisers. So like once, twice a month. Okay, so once or twice a month they'll get together to talk about stuff and then they'll have a fundraiser. So if you're an adult uh, and uh, 21 and over, is there a stipulation on that? Mm -hmm. No? Just they have to act like an adult. Okay. <laughs> so somebody who can act like an adult uh, that can kind of help them, chaperone them. Uh, I guess the Relay for Life folks want them to have an adult sponsor. Um, how much does it cost to be an adult sponsor or to be a part of your team? Well, registration is $10 online and $15 on paper, but you have to have a credit card to register online. Okay, so 15 bucks if you're writing a check, 10 bucks if you can do it online. And, um, okay, and then most importantly, uh, how are you raising money for this and uh, what is it that you want them to know about what's coming up for them to, for the church to participate? Well, on Monday, we're having a car wash. That's tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> we're having a car wash and book and bake sale here at 436. Okay, so tomorrow, a car wash. So if you have a car and you need it washed, bring it here to the building. Are we sure that the water here works? Have you checked that out? We're just using buckets for soapy water. Oh, you're just, you're not going to need a spigot. Okay, so we're just going to get your car real soapy, and then we'll say, see ya. <laughs> which for me would be even more important. And, and you do have people bringing, a bunch of people bringing some baked goods for that, right? Yep. Yep. Okay, so there you go. Tomorrow, 4.30 to 6, anything that you can do to help, how much money do you have to have as a team to participate in Relay for Life? $1,500. Okay, $1,500 they're going to try to raise. So we need some help, guys. Um, so, all right, thank you. That wasn't so bad. Was that so bad? Good job. Did I embarrass you? Okay, awesome. Mr. Thompson. And uh, Megan, when is your uh, Relay for Life stuff that's coming up? You have a couple things coming up. Saturday. This Saturday, and what is that? So this Saturday, at what time? At 7 o'clock here, Music for the Cure. There'll be some folks lined up that are going to play some music. We'll get Wayne on karaoke. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have a good time. 
Uh, and how are you raising money with that? Is this that free will donation or? Okay. And then anything else coming up? Okay, so June 9th, a yard sale here. All day? Uh, probably start at 9 in the morning, 9, 10 o'clock, and going until mid-afternoon, depending on the lifestyle. 9 or 10 till 2 or 3, somewhere in there, okay? On June 9th. All right, good. So some good stuff coming up for Relay for Life stuff, and uh, hopefully you guys can all participate and help out with that. So we're grateful for that. Uh, like I said this morning, we're going through, or I've been reading through the book of Job for the last couple of weeks. Uh, Job is an interesting uh, character. This guy has it all. I was trying to think, and I racked my brain and racked my brain for someone that I could point out to today, that's living today, that I could say, you know, that's a modern Job. A guy who's wealthy, politically connected, extremely charitable, uh, a follower of God, uh, and I rack my brain and rack my brain. Someone that God would say was blameless, full of integrity. Uh, do you guys know many Because <laughs> I rack my brain. And I gotta tell you, as an American, I thought of one person, and I don't know if he fits the bill completely, but it just in my head, kind of, sorta, I think if someone's gonna be like Joe, maybe it could be a guy like Jimmy Carter. He's he's kind he's wealthy, he does a lot of charitable work, he's very politically connected, he's a follower of God, he teaches Sunday school at his church. I mean, I may not agree with everything politically that he thinks. I probably wouldn't agree with Joe <laughs> politically either, but. But I, that's the best I could come up with, okay? It's really tough. And, and the point is, it's really tough to find someone like Job. To think of people even in your life that you might be able to point to that could say, that person is, I would say that person was a lot like Job. There is in the human condition a power that often goes untapped. And that power is suffering. Every human being, some of our youngest among us may not appreciate this truth right now. Some of the oldest among us would appreciate it a lot more. But suffering is the human condition. Suffering happens to every human being. No person who has lived or will live on the earth will be exempt from difficult and trying times. Death comes to everyone, doesn't it? At some point, we all die. Our friends, our loved ones, our family, in various ways, in different ages, there's no standard for death. The power of suffering that comes through a person is through endurance and perseverance and joy. The reason I say that there is a power that often remains untapped is because for a lot of folks, we don't tap into endurance and perseverance and joy when we're enduring suffering. We have a tendency to go the opposite direction when we suffer. Sometimes we just simply give in to the temptation to submit to the pain of whether it's emotional or physical or both, and we just give up our faith. A lot of people have done that. Or we tend, or and, we tend to blame God for it. A lot of people do that. We also worry incessantly about things that we absolutely have no control over. Anytime that we do these things, we give up our faith, uh, we blame God, we worry about things we have no control over. We steal God's power in that moment. But the converse is true. If we show stronger faith through suffering, if we praise God instead of blame Him in our suffering, and if we don't worry, in fact, we look forward to the future with anticipation through our suffering. Power.
power is revealed in a mighty way. And Job teaches us this morning these things. In Job chapter 1 verse 8, God says this about Job. He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and he stays away from evil. That's quite a compliment coming from God. From time to time, I have conversations with people who, when they're enduring suffering, will say, I'm having like a job, a, a job moment, or I'm, I'm going through something, I'm experiencing trial like Job, I'm, I'm being punished like Job, or, or something like that, I'm being picked on like Job. Have you ever heard anyone say something similar to that? Have you made, ever thought that way yourself? I would caution you, though, to not compare yourself to Job's situation. I caution myself first. Because I compare myself to Job's character and I think I fall short. I'm not so sure God would say the same thing about me that he said about Job. The reason Job was picked on was because of his impeccable character and his integrity to begin with. <coughs> God's definition of Job's character is proven through his suffering. Job does not succumb to the same temptations that many of us do. He does not give up his faith in God. He does not blame or curse God. But instead, he proclaims this. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We sing a song, a modern hymn, if you will. Blessed be the name of the Lord comes from this scripture. He gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We bless him when he gives. We bless him when he takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So let's take a moment and see how like Job, we can have this power. We can uh, proclaim his power through suffering. First, never under any circumstances, give up faith in God and in His power. Suffering is a vehicle that allows us an opportunity to display that power. If we respond to our suffering with undeterred faith, endurance, and joy, then we showcase the power of that Holy Spirit as we're given strength and comfort. We are actually providing, through our suffering, through the Holy Spirit, an unparalleled testimony to those in our circle of influence, to our undying, uh, undying devotion to our Father and to our Lord. If we falter, we break that testimony. A couple of weeks ago, uh, as Christy was sitting at the bedside by Jared, uh, one of our favorite nurses, we, we have our favorite, um, Pam, you're a favorite. Uh, we have, our, we have a, our favorite, and this one particular, is, is, her name is Ruth, she's great. And she walked in, and she just sat down next to Christy, and she said, I can really tell that faith is important to you. And I can tell that you're getting through this because of your faith. And I would just like to know more about that. How does that work? And that is the power of showing testimony through suffering. The Thessalonian Christians, uh, Paul had planted churches all over Asia Minor, Minor, and Thessalonica was one church that he started. The churches that Paul planted were heavily persecuted almost from the get-go. It's amazing that the church in the first century took off at all. It's interesting to me that it was much more vibrant then than the church is in, the, in, the, in North America today. I mean, do you hear of any, do you hear thousands and thousands of people coming to the Lord today? Do you, do you, do you just, do you hear excitement in the Lord's church today about how hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are coming to the Lord every single day. I mean, we just don't have that kind of, in the first century they did. In the first century, it wasn't anything new for Paul to go to a community and thousands of people respond to his message, drop to their knees and worship God and become church 
in every community that he went to. The message of the cross was powerful, but it was in the midst of heavy persecution. Anyone who acknowledged Jesus Christ as Savior had a big bullseye and their family and their businesses and their jobs tacked onto them. The Romans hated Christians because they wouldn't worship Caesar. And they were seen as a threat to the political climate, to the peace, the Roman peace. The locals hated Christians because they didn't support the local economy, especially in Asia Minor, where there was a lot of pagan worship rituals, where in every city like Ephesus and Corinth and Thessalonica and other cities, there were these huge, massive temples to these gods. And there was a huge economy based around those temples. People sold trinkets. Uh, people sold... Uh, there's young people in the room, so I don't want to say exactly, but they would sell stuff. And for worship. And it was a prolific business, these trinkets, these idols, these uh, different things that they sold. <laughs> you should read it for yourself. <laughs> it was big business. And the Christians didn't, and if there were a lot of them all at one time that came to the Lord, guess what? That was a significant dip in the local economy. All of a sudden, there was a bunch of people not buying idols, a bunch of people not buying trinkets, a bunch of people not going to the temple. And that was a problem. So the locals hated them. The local Jewish rabbis and teachers of the law hated Jewish Christians especially because they were seen as traitors. So they were hated. If you were to go to, if we were living in the first century and any one of you were to run or were to go down into Wayman, you would, on any given day, be persecuted. You would be made fun of. You would have dirt thrown at you. You would have someone spit at you. You would have someone cuss you out. You would be threatened every day. Your house would be marked. You would have things thrown at it all the time. This is the kind of environment Christians lived in in the first century. This is not an exaggeration. If anything, I'm not even selling it for what it was. It was worse. And yet the Christian church flourished in the first century in spite of all that. Suffering was a part of their life. Suffering was a part of their testimony. It was the most powerful part of their testimony. The reason the church grew like it did in the first century was because of the power of suffering. And the testimony that came from it. When Paul wrote most of his letters, he wrote them for four reasons. One, he wanted to encourage each truth with the truth of their salvation and the reward of Jesus to, be, to motivate them to stay faithful in suffering from persecution. A lot of what Paul wrote was about that. He felt compelled to make sure that the sovereignty and deity of Christ was protected from any false teaching. And he taught the local church how to conduct itself through its leaders in practice. And he wanted to share with Jewish Christians that people didn't have to become Jews in order to be followers of Christ. Those are four basic reasons. But one of the main reasons he wrote was to motivate people to be faithful through suffering. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 19, this is what Paul says. And this is talking about how to endure suffering. When people are throwing rocks at you, when your co-workers want to kill you, when, when your father-in-law wants to take you and stone you, when your kids are taken from you, when you're thrown in jail, when you're being thrown into the Colosseum to be eaten by lions, this is what Paul said should be your experience. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. We stifle the Holy Spirit in our life. We stop Him cold. When in our suffering we deny our faith. When in our suffering we blame instead of praise Him. And we stop Him cold. When we decide in our suffering that we're just going to give up on him. And that we're just going to worry instead of rely on his promises.
In these verses, Paul is encouraging the Christians in Thessalonica to stay faithful in suffering, joy, prayer, gratefulness, and allowing the Holy Spirit to work. Why? Because the more those who are persecuting, the more those who are doing the hurting and the killing, the more that these people were pressuring the Christians to give up their faith, they were more and more being exposed to the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God is alive and it's active and it's powerful. And we see the evidence of God's word and Paul's influence in many stories of the early Christians. A second generation disciple and church leader named Ignatius was condemned to die by being fed to lions. And as he was in the arena waiting for the lions to be released, this is what he is quoted to have said. Now I begin to be a disciple. Now. As he's in the Colosseum, waiting for lions to devour him, now he says, I am a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things, so that I may win but Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let breaking of bones and tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon me. Be it so, only may I win Christ Jesus. As he heard the lions roaring, he said, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts, that I may be found pure bread. I don't know about you. Me? I'm in the Colosseum. I hear roaring. I, know, or, uh, roaring. I hear them roaring. I know they're hungry. And I know I'm their meal. I'm not standing there preaching a sermon. I'm running like a junior high girl screaming at the top of my lungs trying to find a place to hide. That's me. This takes strength, guys. Who would stand in the middle of a coliseum and preach a sermon when they know they're facing death? But he wasn't the only one. In scripture, Stephen's a great example. He preaches a sermon as he's being stoned. How can people do that? How do you get strength like that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. It comes to you in suffering when you believe and you open your heart to the power of God. That's what happens. And it's an incredible, incredible thing. In 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered. He is your example. You must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor did he deceive anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. I think every brother and sister in this room should hear that scripture. If you have brothers and sisters and you live at home, Jesus did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God. Try saying that to your sibling the next time you get in an argument. I'm going to leave you in the hands of God. <laughs> and walk away. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. Suffering. In Ephesians 5, 2, live a life filled with love. Follow the example of Christ. He loved us, and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. We follow his example. Power in suffering. So first, never under any circumstances, give up your faith in God or in his power. Number two, this is tough. Refuse the temptation to blame God. Refuse the temptation to blame God. It is a sin to blame God when you're going through suffering. Not a sin to question. A difference when we question why God. Job asked why. Not a sin to ask why. It is a sin to blame God. You, God, are the fault of why I'm enduring this. It's because of you that I'm suffering. That is a sin. In Job 1.22, it says, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. 
Now, why is it a sin to blame God for our suffering? Because it's impossible to praise Him at the same time you're blaming Him. You can't do both. If you're blaming God, you can't praise Him. And if the Scripture teaches us that we're supposed to praise Him in all circumstances and in everything, you can't do both. You can't blame someone out of one side of your mouth and praise them out of the other. Not unless you're a hypocrite. But if you're genuine and you really mean what you're saying, you cannot blame and praise at the same time. Blame is the opposite of praise. In Revelation 4.11, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. In Romans 8.35-39, Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, angels or demons, our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. There is no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. I believe what is needed more than anything else in our church today is a shift in our perspective about God. Because He alone is worthy of our praise and admiration. Our very existence, both physical and emotional, is dependent on Him. Our eternity is dependent on Him. We need to understand that God is love, and we like to talk about that part of His nature. But this same God, who is love, allowed His own Son to die a cruel and torturous death by execution on a cross as a common criminal. And I'm a dad. Would I ever let my son go through that if I had the power to stop it? No. But I'm not God. God is love. But He hates sin. And He hates your sin with a passion. And he hates my sin. Because sin brought death into the world. And sin cannot coexist in his presence. He kicks sinners out of his presence. He denies sinners access to his holy place. We defile heaven. And he won't allow heaven to be defiled. Jesus Christ is the only way. That a sinner like you and I. Have any access at all to the Father. You should fear God. You should be scared to death. Of what God can do to you. He is the creator of the universe. He is the judge of all. You stand no chance of God's justice and his holy and righteous wrath unless Jesus Christ is standing between you and him. God is not to blame for our suffering. Sin is. God is worthy of our praise because when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at the right time and died for us sinners. Romans 5, 6. Never under any circumstances give up faith in God and in His power. Refuse the temptation to blame Him. And last, when we worry, we demean or lessen the power of God. Basically, this is worry. This is what it says. And this is my interpretation of worry. It's what I feel when I'm worried. God, I know what you said. You're there for me. You're going to take care of my needs. I read that in Scripture. You've provided me an escape from my eternal judgment through Jesus, and I'm grateful for all that, but I'm really not sure I believe it. Thanks anyway. That's worry. I'm not really sure. In the back of my mind, I'm not really sure if the promises of God really ring true or not. That's what I'm saying when I worry. In Job 2, verse 10, he says to his wife, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? Should we worry about what anything is going to happen to us if God is in control? A couple of weeks ago, I wanted to conclude by reading 2 Corinthians 4. And I decided this morning I'm going to do it. I don't know how many of you did that or if you even remembered me asking you to do that. But this morning we're going to do, we're going to read 2 Corinthians 4, because anytime we talk about the context of suffering, or going through difficult times, I, I have to think I'm not the only one that's going through a difficult time right now. 
There's a lot of people in here that have their own trials, that have their own burdens, that are going through some pretty heavy stuff. There are a lot of people. And so it's not just me. And I really feel like 2 Corinthians 4 has been such a, a help to me. And I hope that it will be a help to you, for those of us who are going through whatever burdens and trials that we're dealing with. So 2 Corinthians 4, and I'll conclude with this. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, this is through Jesus Christ, through relationship with him, we never give up. Now remember, he's talking about he himself is going through incredible persecution. And the people he's talking to are going through incredible persecution. You think you have troubles. I think I have troubles. It's nothing in comparison to what these people were dealing with. I can promise you. We never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the word of God. We tell the truth before God, and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, even if that veil is suffering, it's hidden from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts, so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ, even and especially in the face of suffering. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. Verse 8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. Sometimes we ask why, but we're not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we never abandon God, and we're never abandoned by Him. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes. We live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, whether that's cancer or some other terminal illness or persecution, we live in the face of death, all of us. But this has resulted in eternal life for you. We continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. As more and more people are reached through suffering, more and more people are going to give more glory to God. In the end, that's what it's all about. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are renewed every day. Our troubles, our present troubles, are small. Whatever you're dealing with today... No matter how massive and, and awesome it may seem like today to overcome, it's small, and it will not last very long. <laughs> Yet your troubles produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we now see will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. There is power in suffering. 
The power is revealed to the world around us when we hold on to our faith, when we praise God instead of blaming Him, when we fix our attention on what is eternal rather than worry about what will happen tomorrow. Let's pray. God, I just want to thank you for your word this morning and for the example that is taught through Job and through his life and through his example. I just thank you, God, that um, as we endure suffering in our own troubles and our own trials and our own difficulties, no matter what they may be, no matter how small or how great we may perceive them to be, we have an opportunity in our suffering to bring you more glory to reveal the power of your Holy Spirit um, that you provide, that gives us what we need in order to endure it. You did it for Jesus. He endured the cross. That's what Hebrews tells us. We endure suffering uh, as well. And we can bring the same glory to you that Jesus gave when we just never give up when we always keep our faith in you, when we praise you consistently, when we just put our faith in your promises and refuse to worry about tomorrow. I just want to thank you, God, so much for those truths. And, um, and I do pray that through our suffering, through whatever trials and difficulties we bring today, that your glory is being made more evident through them, not less. I pray this, God, I pray this through all of us who are here this morning and through all of us who are called in your name who live in this community. May we always bring more glory to you, God, in everything that we do, no matter what the circumstances are or what we face in any given day. Thank you, God, so much for just the opportunity to share your glory with other people. Our eyes are fixed on your son, Jesus, and we all are eagerly anticipating our return with you. Thank you. Thank you, God, for giving us Jesus. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.